Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and thank you for this opportunity to come together in peace and study your word. Lord, I ask that you send your Holy Spirit upon us that we might understand these things and that we might be changed by these truths. Please forgive us of our sins and watch over us. In Jesus' name, amen. So what we're doing at this point is trying to build a platform for understanding the unfolding light of the midnight cry. We started yesterday by saying that in Matthew 16, rightly understood, Jesus places that history in our history and he tells the disciples he's going to then, he began to then unfold to them his going into Jerusalem and what he was to suffer. Okay, Matthew 16, is it verse 21? Would someone read that just to remind us? I think it's 21, but I'm probably wrong. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Okay, so from that time forward when Peter is giving his testimony that he understands the message of the dove, the message of the empowerment of that time, that Christ is the Messiah. And Peter's also speaking for Satan. He's illustrating the everlasting gospel in here. And Jesus is warning them about whether they're going to eat the bread of heaven or the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. In this history, he says, from that time forward, Christ began to unfold them about him going into Jerusalem. And when he goes into Jerusalem, that's the triumphal entry. And Sister White uses the triumphal entry to illustrate the midnight cry of the Millerite history. So at this point, prophetically, Christ is removing his hands from the disciples' eyes and explaining them about this history in here, the tearing time, the midnight cry in his time period. And in the upcoming newsletter, secondary witness. There's a midnight cry set up at the beginning of the path, but in the front, on the path of the way to heaven, Christ is waving his glorious right arm, and Sister White identifies that when he raises, waves his glorious right arm, that's him shedding light about the midnight cry. So the opening up of the midnight cry is a subject of prophecy. It's something that is addressed. It's not just something that we're observing by our own human reasoning. It's a symbol. Or it's symbolized. And that's, it's symbolized in the Millerite history. He removed his hand at the tearing time in the Millerite history, and then they began to understand the truth. They're, they had to understand they were in the tearing time. She says the fact that the churches started fighting against them was necessary to prepare them to accept the message of the second angel. It led to the Exeter camp meeting where they have this message that led to the closed door of the cross in the time of, history, of the time of Christ. So what I'm saying is we're now at the point where those three witnesses, Matthew 16, uh, the Millerite history, Ellen White's first vision, are, are showing that the Lord is removing his hand about this history. And what we're dealing with now is he's doing it, he, he began to do it in a profound way with Ezra 7.9, Ezra 7, 9, in conjunction with Ezekiel 12, is where you have the effect of every vision. So now those of us that are seeing the effect of every vision have the responsibility to try to rightly divide the word of truth and put these things in place. And we're, and we're finding all kinds of things. We're finding the 120, right? We're finding the 70. We're finding the three months. But if you have three months here, what do you have here? Four months. Four months. So this whole history is seven months. So we know that 9-11 uh, from Joel and all the related stuff, that you have four generations that are going to take place in here. That's the four months, right? You're going to be tested by the history of Adventism. The, the four months... From, from what we're understanding about the four generations, it's, it's you know, the four abominations of Ezekiel 8. 
what we're, what we're doing, what we're actually, when we study, what we're going to try to put in place here today is that it's the four times that the expression seven times is found in Leviticus 26. All these things are coming together, right? You follow me? So, like with, like with here, if you, if you understand that these, if you can see that 120 days is four months, then there's at one level that this history here is divided up into four months, and you already know that in this history you're going to be tested by the four <laughs> generations, and you've already established that the four generations are the image of jealousy, the secret chambers, the weeping for Tammuz, the bowing down to the sun, and you've established that this is Ephesus, right? They forget their first love. What are they supposed to do? Remember, there's Manasseh, okay? Then this is Smyrna, persecution starts. This is Pergamos, a falling away that leads to Thyatira. There's going to be a class of people here in this history that get to the fourth month that will have developed a character prepared to represent Thyatira. But we know the correct pioneer understanding is that there is a four, three division in the seven churches. Okay. The, the pioneers understood that of the Millerites, there was two classes. One class was Laodicea, the other class was Philadelphia, and the Millerites believed they were carrying their message to Sardis. Okay, so when we get to here at the Midnight Cry, we've already understood that there'll be two classes from this history that are manifested. And Sister White says the foolish virgins are Laodiceans. Okay, so when you get to here and find you have no oil, what are you? Laodicean. If you have oil, what are you? And we know that the Philadelphians are going to carry a message to those people that are still in Adventism that haven't been confronted with this message, so they're Sardis. Okay. Yeah. But this, this gets repeated out here, does it not? Once, once, all, uh, once the first fruits are developed, because we've got the two-step development of the, f the first fruits in our history, once the first fruits are developed and the door is closed, the first fruit offering is lifted up as an end sign. Adventism that receives the mark of the beast, Laodiceans, are spewed out of the mouth of the Lord. Adventism that receives the seal of God, Philadelphians, are going to carry the message to the 11th hour workers, Sardis Sardisians. Right? I thought In this temple cleansing, okay. this is the fractal, all right? In this temple cleansing, here are those Adventists that haven't been t confronted, that have not been held accountable for this light here, are the Sardisians that are going to hear the message. Now, th this, is, this is important to see, too. This is... This is emphasizing the experience of, Advent, of, the, of the wise and foolish virgins. So this is, this is basically, you can read back into this, the parable of the ten virgins, okay, which is, illustrates the experience of Seventh-day Adventists. So this is seven churches, but we know that the seven seals also have a 4-3 a breakdown, right? Um, and the last of the seven seals these seals are talking about not the internal struggle or testing process within the church, but the external. That's pioneer understanding. The seven churches, internal. Seven seals, external. Right? So when we're looking at, when we're illustrating the external, Seventh-day Adventists are required to see 9-11. That was external. It went on worldwide. Everyone's seeing it. And then comes the image of the beast test. Church and state coming together in the United States. Then the Sunday law. These are external. But we understand that, the, that there's fractals in here. This history for us has two parts. So when you look at it that way, when you get to the fifth seal... What does Sister, does anyone know what Sister White says about the fifth seal? She says, she quotes the fifth seal. What's the fifth seal say as a paraphrase? There's souls under the martyr, souls under the altar with 
white raiment, and they're asking how long until you punish the papacy for killing us. And it says, uh, rest in your graves a little while until the second group that's going to be martyrs like you is made up. Okay, and then Sister White comments on this. She says, this refers to events in the future, and she places it where? No, future. Where, what's the event? She quotes, uh, she quotes a Bible passage to, to lock you into the events in the future when the Lord is going to deal with the papacy for the persecution of the Dark Ages and for the persecution at the end of the world. Revelation 18.4. <coughs> so she's saying, in the fifth seal, she places it here. So what I'm saying is you put, is you put the seals into this history. Right here, after this separation, the, the martyrs of the Dark Ages cry out and say, how long until you punish the papacy? And they're told, rest in your graves a little while until another group such as you is made up. And this is, this is advancing to this very history, the Sunday Law, where this is fulfilled. And you can see it in here. And of course, the seven, what's the seventh seal? Yeah, but what, what's he do in the seventh seal? He takes coal off the altar and he throws it down. The seventh seal is, is marking the full outpouring of the latter rain here. All right, so uh, all I'm saying is, in this history, we see the first fruits being developed. Christ and then those that were resurrected. We see the 120 all the implications of the 120. We see the 70. And when I say all, I'm not suggesting that we understand it all, but we're it's just unbelievable. You, we, we, see, we see the story of Elijah in here. Where's the story of Elijah? Elijah. Right here. Elijah. Okay, th this here, what is, what is manifested here? Yeah, this is the, the, the distinction between the true and false prophets of Adventism. You know, so you've got this Elijah being laid over. You've got the story of Elisha. You've got the plowings. You've got four months, three months. You've got seven months. All right, so. Just real quick for those of us that couldn't sit in all the meetings or attend meetings. I understand the three months out of the 70 to 10 overlap into it. Inclusive. Oh, inclusive. So inclusive. I, inclusive. That's so in, the Hebrew way is inclusive reckoning. Okay. If it touches part of one month, it includes the whole month. Why do you think, though, that it's 10? Why do you think it's 30, 30, 10? Do you see any significance in that month has been broken up into 10 days? You know how it's broken up? There probably is some reason for it. But you're yeah. not teaching it yet. No. Well, we, what we are teaching is that this history here is 50 days okay. and that this history is 40 and then this is 10 and 10 represents a testing period here so the number 10 is here the, the 40 here is the the test of public evangelism as illustrated in the 40 years of wilderness wandering and the 40 year periods of Moses life and the 40 years of Isaac the 40 days of Christ in the wilderness. Um, but there also is the 40 days after the cross that leads to the disciples spending 10 days in advance of Pentecost, which is the Sunday law. <laughs> it's just out of real. The Sunday law is the 10th day of that, so then counting backwards from 10. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. But anyway, we're dealing with the most divine revelation of truth that, that's ever been opened up, so we cannot possibly come to grips with it in a short period of time. This is going to take some study and God's grace and leading. One of these you got? Yeah. Muchas gracias.
All right, so <clears throat> I'm, gonna, I, I'm binding off yesterday's presentation with the first couple of quotes. Yesterday, we were dealing with the seven kings, right? And we showed that Manasseh, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Manasseh in 677 is illustrating a progressive fall of the glorious land. This is Manasseh. And there are very significant and important truths just in this, in terms of the conquering of the United States, the religious horn and Millerite history, the political horn in our history, because this history is repeated down here. And we came to understand that 1989, the time of the end for us, that's Manasseh, 1798, Manasseh, Manasseh. And we came to understand that Reagan means little king. I like that. I don't know how it fits, but I like that. So one of the truths that you derive from this is that this horn of the Protestants gets conquered here and the horn of the state for the United States gets conquered here. So in connection with that, the, what we didn't get to, and I know this is all a familiar quote to us, is the Great Controversy 389, bringing this progressive fall of the glorious land beginning with Manasseh to a conclusion. It says, the second angel's message of Revelation 14 was first preached in the summer of 1844 and it then had a more direct application to the churches of the United States where the warning of the judgment had been most widely proclaimed and most generally rejected and where the declension in the churches had been most rapid. But the message of the second angel did not reach its complete fulfillment in 1844. The churches then experienced a moral fall in consequence of their refusal of the light of the Advent message, but that fall was not complete. And then she quotes from 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9 and 9-11. It says, Not until this condition shall be reached and the union of church and state with the world shall be fully accomplished throughout Christendom will the fall of Babylon be complete. The change is a progressive one and the perfect fulfillment of Revelation 14, 8 is yet future. So in here she's teaching, just as we're applying that the fall of the United States is a progressive fall, beginning in the Millerite history, ending in our history. And what we're saying is this is, an, this is an argument that Manasseh being the seventh... How do you say that correctly? He's this, the first of the last seven kings, I guess. The, he's the first of the last seven kings is illustrating the progressive fall of the glorious land. The literal glorious land with Manasseh, the figurative glorious land here at the end of the world. And when I was looking up some stuff on the, the king's names yesterday, I came across this passage from Prophets and Kings. It fits in nicely. <clears throat> it says, within a few short years, the king of Babylon was to be used as an instrument of God's wrath upon impenitent Judah. Again and again, Jerusalem was to be invested and entered by the besieging armies of Nebuchadnezzar. Company after company, at first a few only, but later on thousands and ten thousands were to be taken captive to the land of Shinar, there to dwell in enforced exile. Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, Zedekiah, all these Jewish kings were in turn to become vassals of the Babylonian ruler, and all in turn were to rebel. Severe and yet more severe chastisements were to be inflicted upon the rebellious nation until at last the entire land was to become a desolation. Jerusalem was to be laid waste and burned with fire. The temple that Solomon had built was to be destroyed and the kingdom of Judah was to fall never again to occupy its former position among the nations of the earth. And that just fits really nicely with Sister White saying Manasseh is in earnest of what's to come. Here she's bringing it, you know, they fit together. So that's in the record. All right, now we will begin to show, hopefully, that Manasseh, Jehoiakim, 
Jehoiachin and Zedekiah are four way marks in the history of the Millerites and four way marks in our history. And they're, they represent the scattering. They represent many, many things. But they represent the scattering. The way you lock that in is with Leviticus 26. And we're going to show that Levit the first time seven times is mentioned, Manasseh fulfilled that. The second time the seven times is listed in Leviticus 26, Jehoiakim fulfilled it, third, Chin, fourth, Zedekiah. Um, this is where, this, this light here, when this was brought into the public arena, this is where this movement was starting to be splintered. And I don't have a sense that, that the people that are, are upset about how I've handled newsletters and stuff have been keeping track with this, but this ties in. You, ha you have to have this in place to understand the logic that at 9-11, you're going to be tested with the sins of your fathers. Because this also represents the sins of your fathers. Is there any significance coupled with sins of the name of Kenneth by the Babylonian kings? Yes. Yeah, and I don't think I... Because I, I know we're not going to get there today. The question is, is there any significance that some of these kings have their names changed? Um, I've put that in. When we get there, I, I've, I've noted that. I'm not sure that I understand the full significance because like uh, Eliakim's change to Jehoiakim, it means the same thing. Um, but some of them, it isn't the case. Like for Zedekiah, a really significant one. Zedekiah's name was, what was Zedekiah's name? Uh, anyway, his, his name is talking about the gathering uh, in fact, it can mean restore. It's emphasizing the 2520, his, his former name. But his, it's, his name is changed to represent Zedekiah, which is the 2300. And I forget what his name was changed from. Someone wants to pull that out so we don't look ignorant here in this DVD online. <laughs> but and we're not dealing with that. That's in the future. His, his original name, is a, you can see, is a symbol Mataniah. of the... What? Mataniah. Mataniah, you look it up. You can see in there the references. It means gift of God. Gift of God. It's They're the Matthias. gift of God. It's Matthias. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's Great. the gift. That's at, at October 22nd, 1844, the host was being restored. It was being taken into the most holy place as a gift in the, the, the Day of Atonement the feast. Up as a gift to those feasts of God. Yeah. So when he gives us a new name, Who? When their names are changed, right? Because if it on one side means covenant of life, then the evil side would be the covenant of death. Or does that not fit? I don't know. You'd have to. Uh, I, I don't know. You'd have to. There is a definitely two covenants going on here. I don't. And yeah, I would think that. Um, in Revelation, there's two in two of the churches. There's a it references the fact that. You hate those that say they are Jews, but they're not. Okay, there's a class that's represented in the churches that profess to be God's covenant's people, profess to have his name, but do not. Those are, that's the class that's entering in with the covenant of death, I would say. But I haven't looked at that. But So, Brother Michael, let's start with you. I, the reason that, <coughs> that I have the whole verses in here you know, I could just have the reference to it, and we could read it out of the Bible. But I have it in here because I had highlight, highlighted what we're going to look at from the verses afterwards. So we're going to, and from Leviticus 26, 18 through 20, which is the first time the seven times is mentioned in Leviticus 26, we're going to look at what it means that how it was fulfilled that he would break the pride of your power, and that their heavens would become as iron and brass. So if you want to read Pride of Power, Brother Michael. And if you will not yet... Nope, nope. Pride, the Pride of Power. Oh, the next one. Right. The government of the kingdom of Israel was completely broken for the first time in the days of Manasseh, king of Judah, when the captains of the host of Assyria came to Jerusalem and took it, and took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters, 
and carried him to Babylon. Before that, Judah had sometimes been oppressed by their enemies and sometimes Israel. But one or the other of the two kingdoms remained independent up to that time, when both were carried away captive and the pride of their power was broken. This captivity, according to all chronologers, was 677 B.C. It was, to, it was to continue in a tributary and captive state for seven times, or 2,520 years. But it is asked, did not Manasseh return back to Jerusalem again and reign many years after that? I answer, yes. Keep reading, keep reading, Michael. But he reigned as a tributary and dependent of the king of Assyria, and so did all the kings who succeeded him in Jerusalem. As Nehemiah testified, Nehemiah 9.32, after rehearsing the whole history. Who, who's Nehemiah? Where is Nehemiah in history? Where is, where is uh, Manasseh? He's 677. And it's, the history is going to progress all the way down to Zedekiah. And Jerusalem's destroyed and they're carried into captivity 70 years. Then the Lord brings them out of Babylon and they're rebuilding the temple. This is where Nehemiah is at. So when he's referencing Nehemiah 9.32, and let's read that. You can read that, Brother Michael. He's referencing a history well after Manasseh. Nehemiah is. Now, just read it. Now therefore our God, the great and mighty and the terrible God, who keep his covenant history, let not all the troubles seem little before thee that hath come upon us on our kings, on our princes, and on our priests, and on our prophets, and on our fathers, and on all thy people, since the time the kings of Assyria unto this day. So he's marking that their national sovereignty has never been restored, ever since the king of Assyria took Manasseh captive, uh, the pride of their power had been broken. What's power in Bible prophecy? State. State. Why? Dragon. Dragon? Dragon, what's dragon mean? The dragon is the state and he has power. He gets the power. The power comes from the dragon. The cap power comes from the dragon. What about Alexander the Great? What did he have that, that no one could stand in his way? He had power. What was it? His military strength. Power is military and political. Okay, so they're, what's the pride of their power? The king, the, which ruled over military and political. It was taken away in 677. Okay. The verse says that they're going to be, the heavens are going to become as iron and brass. You want to read that, Brother Mark, <coughs> loud and clear? It was when the heavens were as brass or as tall that he trusted more fully in God. More than most men, he knew the meaning of affliction, but listened to his triumphant cry as beset by temptation and conflict, his feet pressed heavenward. Our light affliction which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. For we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Next one. Ahab knew that it was by the word of God that the heavens had become as brass. Yet he sought to cast upon the prophet the blame for the heavy judgments resting on the land. So what, what I'm saying here, is the first time the seven times is referenced in Leviticus 26, that one of the things is that the pride of their power was going to be removed, and the pioneers mark that as 677 with Manasseh. But then, in the same passage in Leviticus 26, their heavens were going to become as brass and the earth as iron. And brass represents afflicts, affliction and judgment. And Nehemiah has just given testimony in verse 32 of Nehemiah 9, that from the time of the Syrians to that very day, they've been afflicted and they've been under the judgments of God. So, Sister Brittany, what's iron? God has said, had said that his people should be saved, that the yoke he would lay upon them should be light, that they 
face and many uncomplaining years to his plan. Their servitude was represented by a yoke of wood, which was easily borne, but resistance would be met with corresponding severity represented by the yoke of iron. So did that take place from Manasseh onward? Yep. So, so Manasseh onward is the fulfillment of Leviticus 26, 8 through 18 through 20, right? You, everyone see the point that I'm trying to make here? Mm -hmm. This is the first seven times, Manasseh. How many times is the seven times referenced in Leviticus 26? Four. So it's, how many kings are in this history? Seven. But, but Bible prophecy is placing an emphasis on four because it's going to teach something about four kings even though it's teaching something about the seven kings in the level of the seven thunders. There's another truth connected with the four kings. So the next one is Jehoiakim. Go ahead. One of them references that the heavens were brass and another one references that the heavens were iron. Um, Don't know what that. No, you find that, that reversed in the scriptures. Sometimes the, the earth beneath you is brass, and, and sometimes it's iron, and above is heaven. <laughs> this probably means something. I've never thought it through, but I've seen that. Okay. Well, when you think about brass and, and, and the form of metal, brass is softer than metal, and iron, iron is harder to break. Yeah, and brass is the kingdom of Greece, iron, the kingdom of Rome. I, I, I don't know. Sister, did Sister Brittany already read? Uh, it's Sister Christy. Now we're looking at the second reference for Isaiah, for Leviticus 26. And what I'm I suggesting is that this was fulfilled by Jehoiakim. And the components of Leviticus 26, verses 21 and 22, which is where the seven times is referenced the second time, that we're going to look for, is that he's going to send wild beasts among them. When, when Jehoiakim fulfills the second seven time, wild beasts will be sent among them. Their children are going to be robbed, and his highways shall be desolate. So, read for us 2 Kings 24 verses 1 and 2, Sister Christie. The point being is, in these four kings here, the only one of the kings that is confronted with more than one nation is Jehoiakim. And he, he has four nations that, are going to be, that God's going to use to judge and chastise him. Okay, the Babylon, the Chaldeans, the Syrians, the Moabites, and the Ammonites. Okay, so... All right, the, uh, the second thing is that the second seven times, the children would get robbed. So whose turn to read? Sister Brawin, read Second Kings 20, verses 17 and 18, and Brother Jason, Jason Daniel 1, 1 through 4. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So this is a prophecy. Uh, who's the prophecy given to? Hezekiah's curse. <coughs> Hezekiah's curse. 
So there's a prophecy that when Babylon comes, some of Hezekiah's children are going to be carried into Babylon. When does Babylon come? In the time of Jehoiakim. It was the Syrians that came to Manasseh. This prophecy is fulfilled in Jehoiakim. And now, Brother Jason. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim. Of who? <coughs> Jehoiakim. King of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, King of Judah, into his hand, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding signs, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's house, and whom they might teach the learning and talent of the Chaldeans. So in the time period of Jehoiakim, in the third year of Jehoiakim, or the fourth year of Jehoiakim, I think if you want to look for some distinctions, this prophecy of Hezekiah is fulfilled, but the prophecy of Hezekiah's curse, if that's what we call it, is first set forth in the second expression of seven times of Leviticus 26. It says, he will rob your children. Jehoiakim can be in the second seven times there. This is where the children get robbed. And there's no more reference to the children getting robbed. The children that are getting robbed that are the subject of prophecy is Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right? So Jehoiakim, stepping out of what we haven't studied. Are you, what are you looking that way for? Okay, in... Yes, if you don't understand that, we need you to explain that. Hezekiah, he, he should have told the visiting Babylonians, the Chaldeans, the reason the sun went backwards is because of the power and the glory of the Lord, and he should have gave them a, a Bible study. But instead, he walked them around the kingdom. This is their motivation for coming and conquering Jerusalem. And because of his lifting up his self and his worldly kingdom, part of the curse that's laid on him is that in verse 17 of 2 Kings 20, Behold the days come, Hezekiah, for you're lifting yourself up. Behold the days come, that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. That was fulfilled in the time of Jehoiakim. Okay, Hezekiah is way back before Manasseh. So this is a prophecy that's being fulfilled. The stuff, his, his treasures are going to be carried to Babylon. But then the next verse says, and of thy sons that shall issue from thee. Okay, Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego are direct descendants of Hezekiah. Blood descendants. So it says, And of thy sons, Hezekiah, that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And the, the eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon that are marked in Scripture are Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, so Bible, Spirit of Prophecy, and History attests to the fact that Daniel is carried into Babylon not when Nebuchadnezzar comes against Jehoiakim or Zedekiah. They're carried away in the time of Jehoiakim. That's what, what he read, verse 1. In the third year, the reign of Jehoiakim came Nebuchadnezzar. And that's when he took. So this is fulfilling the second seven times in Leviticus 26, which says, and in your notes, if you just go back there, on page two, where it says Jehoiakim, and then it has Leviticus 26, it says, if you walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. I also will send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children. Okay, literally, they're gonna rob you of your children because there's going to be wild beasts that eat their children. But when you apply it figuratively after the time period of the cross, the children that got robbed was Hezekiah's great-great-great-grandchildren, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And this took place 
in the time of Jehoiakim, so the characteristics that are associated with the second expression of seven times in Leviticus 26 were fulfilled by Jehoiakim. Yes? So in our time, the children are robbed through higher education? Well, that might be the ways and means that they're robbed, but the, probably the, more, the better question is, when do they get robbed? Don't say a word. Okay, but don't, don't answer that. He, he taught this in this past camp meeting. When do the children get robbed? Who are the children? Uh, the children are Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? When do they, when do they get robbed? You're saying 9-11, but you're, you're just guessing, right? No, you're thinking of the, but I, we're talking about this. When do they get robbed? Easy answer. In Jehoiakim. Who's Jehoiakim? That's 9-11. Jehoiakim, what does it mean? And Sister White says, at 9-11, the Lord arose to shake terribly the earth. Jehoiakim means the Lord arises. At 9-11, there are children that are taken out of somewhere and thrown into this testing process here, how many children are marked in Scripture that are taken out of here and put into here? One, two, three, four. Okay. There are, they're thrown into this testing process. Where are they taken from? Jerusalem. Okay, which has just got passed by. They're carried into this testing process. But we're not there yet. We first have to understand why these kings are waymarks. Who are the robbers? Who are the robbers? That's a nice question. Who are the robbers? Because at 9-11, that becomes part of the argument of Joel. Are the robbers Islam or are the robbers Rome? Okay. It's always Rome. Yeah. It's always the king of the north. That's a better way to say it. Are you following the logic? Yeah, we're going slow here on this one because this is where, this hasn't put, been really dwelt on. This is part of the truth that hasn't got laid out there because this argument of Joel started sidetracking the issue. These, these kings are the four expressions of the seven times and it is absolutely profound how that is upheld by inspiration. It, it, it blow your mind. Okay, so we're on page, uh, your, your ways shall be desolate. In the second expression of seven times, which we're saying is Jehoiakim, your ways will be desolate. And we, we didn't have this in the notes, but we just made a diversion there. When is Jeho Jehoiakim applied? 9-11. This is Jehoiakim. Right, Sister Brittany? Right, Sister Christy? Brother Brian? Okay, so I, this is Jehoiakim. Right here, Jehoiakim represents someone whose ways are made desolate. What would that be? What takes place at 9-11? Old paths. You have to walk in the old paths, but they said... So Jehoiakim is a symbol of those that aren't going to walk in the old paths. He's going to walk where? In his own ways. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. So the ways. Jeremiah 6.16. Whose turn is it? It's Sister Tanya's turn. Jeremiah 6.16. Okay, so was Jehoiakim given opportunity to be obedient in his record? Yes. He, he was, who did he have to be obedient to? Nebuchadnezzar. How long was he obedient to Nebuchadnezzar? Three years, one, two, three step testing process, and at the end of three years, what did he do? He rebelled. Okay, so he's a symbol of the rebellion of the those in this history that are going through the everlasting gospel. 
So his rebellion is associated with refusing to walk in the old paths. His ways are going to be desolate. Okay, so the three years of Jehoiakim is the three-step testing process of the everlasting gospel from, from here to here. Right? You all, you all follow that? Okay, but we know that it's typifying our history. What's our first test? And a lot of, there's a lot of correct answers. But if you look at the notes, spirit of, spirit of Prophecy. So, Brother Brian, will you read that short quote under the Spirit of Prophecy? One thing is certain. Those Seventh-day Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner will first give up their faith in the warnings and reproofs contained in the testimonies of John's Spirit. Okay, our first test is the Spirit of Prophecy. But our first test is the old path. If you throw out the truths of represented by the history, if you throw out the truths that are symbolically represented by these two tables, you're simultaneously throwing out the spirit of prophecy, whether you understand it or not. She says, I was shown that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered. You throw that out, you're rejecting the spirit of prophecy. I saw that God was in the publishment of the chart by Brother Nichols. Throw it out. You're throwing out the spirit of prophecy. They can't be separated. So what I'm saying is, this three-step testing process, we established this yesterday, if you remember. Nebuchadnezzar comes against these three. This is part of the prophetic chain. The disappointment is they're carried into captivity here in the time of Zedekiah. The number four is Nebuchadnezzar. This is a link in the chain. So it's already been established. So this is the three-step testing process that leads to Zedekiah. And Zedekiah in the Millerite history was the opening of the judgment on October 22, 1844, when the door closed. Zedekiah for us as Seventh-day Adventists is when the door closes at the Sunday Law. So at the broad level, not at the fractal level, there's a three-step testing process that goes on in this history for Seventh-day Adventists. The first test is the old pass and the spirit of prophecy, right in here. How did Jehoiakim relate to the spirit of prophecy? This is one that I like. Um, pardon me? Yep. Amen. Some have heard the reading of the evidence of the binding claims of the law of God and the enjoined obedience to his commandments and have felt their characters to be in such contrast to the requirements that had they been placed in circumstances similar to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, they would have done as he did. A special message was sent to him to be read in his hearing. But after listening to three or four pages, he cut it out with a penknife and cast it into the fire. But this could not destroy the message, for the word of God will never return unto him void. The same Holy Spirit, who had given the first testimony, which was refused and burned, came to the spirit of um, came to the servant of God who caused the first to be written in a roll and repeated the very message that had been rejected, caused the latter to be written and added a great deal more to it. Okay, so that paragraph, we got more to read, but that paragraph, where do you place it? On the road to Emmaus, where, where, where's the, what's the road to Emmaus? Where does it take place? Right after the cross. Where, where are they heading to? Yeah, yeah, where are they heading to? They're heading to Pentecost. They, they're right after the cross. The cross is 9-11. Okay. They, they, 
if you, if you, this is the trick, is getting familiar with these fractals, that you can show that the cross is 9-11. So right after the cross, the Lord is opening to their understanding the prophetic word, and there is a group in that history that will relate to the spirit of prophecy, to the writings of Jeremiah, which we'll show you are the spirit of prophecy, and what are they going to do? They're going to burn them. After, after three or four pages. The, 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 the reform line. The three-one combination is the symbol of the reform lines. They don't burn it, they, they cut it for something. Yeah, you cut pieces out to uphold your, your position. Then you burn it. But, are everyone following this logic? But also, when they do that at 9-11, what are they doing? Yes. They're repeating the sins of their fathers. What was their sins of their fathers? They rejected it too. Okay, because in this story is this twofold rejection. But let's twice reject it uh, by Jehoiakim. Yeah. Series B. Everyone know Series B? You do, because some of the most hard-hitting passages from the Spirit of Prophecy were in the, the book called Series B. Got thrown into the fire when they were moving the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy from Elmshaven to Tacoma Park. They were trying to lighten their load to get across the country. And a guy recognized, no, that shouldn't be in there, and he pulled it out. Several have done that, yeah. What I'm saying is, what I'm trying to get to is that before 9-11, the spirit of prophecy has already been rejected by our forefathers, and it's been, it's been marked in various ways through those four generations. But now, on, our road, on the way to Emmaus, we get confronted with the same test, and that test is marked as Jehoiakim. Um, so let's pass over the next two paragraphs because it talks about the consequences of rejecting a warning message, which is very good. But go to the next place, Brother Tyler. Testimonies to the church. There, there's only... What's the testimonies to the church? Still, still Jeremiah's writing. Yeah, the spirit of prophecy is the testimonies to the church, but what is it in a more... Nine it's the nine volumes. Testimonies to the church. It's, it's the work of Sister White and of... There's only one person that Ellen White says that their writings were the testimonies to the church, and it's Jeremiah. When did Jeremiah, who was Jeremiah interacting with? Jehoiakim. It's, it's Jeremiah's writings that Jehoiakim throws into the fire. So notice, notice what Tyler's going to read here. In his testimonies to the church, Jeremiah constantly referred to the teachings of the book of the law that had been so greatly honored and exalted during Josiah's reign. He emphasized anew the importance of maintaining a covenant relationship with the all-merciful and compassionate being, who upon the heights of Sinai had spoken the precepts of the Decalogue. Jeremiah's words of warning and entreaty reached every part of the kingdom, and all had opportunity to know the will of God concerning the nation. So what I'm saying here, Jeremiah is interacting with Jehoiakim, second king in our consideration. And Sister White is saying that Jeremiah's writings are the testimonies to the church. So it, Jehoiakim was throwing the spirit of prophecy, the testimonies to the church, into the fire. He was cutting up the spirit of prophecy and throwing it into the fire. You, you follow me? N please read the next paragraph, Brother Tyler. The prophets made plain the fact that our Heavenly Father allows His judgments to fall, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. If ye walk contrary unto me, and will not hearken unto me, the Lord had forewarned His people, I, even I, will scatter you among the heathen, heathen, and will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. What is she pulling into this history? <laughs> That's seven times, right there. 
She's pulling it in with the rebellion against the spirit of prophecy by Jehoiakim that typifies the rebellion against the spirit of prophecy immediately after 9-11 that's already taken place in our past history as... That, uh, let's put it this way. When Sister White says, the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and it should not be altered except by inspiration if you bring all our testimony on that subject together, was the 1863 chart an, a correction by inspiration? Mm -hmm. So in 1863, what did they do? They rejected the old past and the spirit of prophecy. Okay, that's right there at 9-11. That's the test. Who's going to be tested by it? Are the people that are still in Jerusalem going to be tested by it? Or is it Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel that have been carried to Babylon? Uh, and, and why is it Babylon? Why, why is 9-11 to the midnight crime, the Sunday law, Babylon? Why did they get carried? How, how can we say they got carried to Babylon? The church isn't Babylon. There, some people are making a covenant of death. Because the church, okay, probably all have a factor, but when that angel comes down at 9 11, what's his message? Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. This is, this is the. the Rejection of scripture. Yeah, it's the symbol of that, that history is Babylon. You're taken into Babylon in that sense to be tested, yes. Yeah, that would, that would be kind of like one of Michael's arguments. <laughs> All right, <laughs> that's, that's really getting out there and pulling some thoughts together. Uh, you get to answer those emails. Uh, next paragraph. At the very time messages of impending doom were urged upon princes and people, their ruler Jehoiakim, who should have been a wise spiritual leader, foremost in confession of sin, and in reformation of good's work was spending his time in selfish pleasure. I will build me a white house and large chambers, he proposed, and this house, sealed with cedar and painted with vermilion, was built with money and labor secured through fraud and oppression. What, what's the impending doom? The Sunday law. At the very time the Sunday... And if you understand the 2520... You know that at the tearing time in the Millerite history and the tearing time in our history, the glorious land is already conquered. So when you're talking about impending doom at 9-11, Rome's already in place to take the United States at the Sunday Law. The only reason it hasn't is because the angels are holding back the four winds. So when, when we're placing Jehoiakim at 9-11, and it says, in a time period of impending doom... That's where we're at. Identical. Next paragraph. The wrath of the prophet was aroused and he was inspired to pronounce judgment upon the faith, faithless ruler. Woe to him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by wrong. And he declared that useth his neighbor's service without wages and giveth him... Let's just... I'll read it. And giveth him not for his work. Shall thou reign, shalt thou reign because thou closest thyself in cedar? Did not thy father eat and drink and do judgment and justice? And then it was well with him. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well with him. Was not this to know me? Saith the Lord. But thine eyes and thine heart are not but for thy covetousness and for to shed innocent blood and for oppression, and for violence, to do it. What's he building? The house on sand. He's building a house on sand. What else? Chambers. Chambers. What's, what's secret chambers? Spiritualism. Where's that mark? Someone said it. 9-11. Spiritual formation. That's the false latter rain message. That's Jehoiachin. He's an instrument of those secret chambers that can go. It's progressive. It's progressive. What comes first? 
Really? What comes first? Oh, are you saying the very first? Yeah, the very first. Is there a distinction between first and very first, my brother? Okay, the image of jealousy. What what came first with Satan? Jealousy. Okay, that's always the first step. You get jealous, and if you don't repent and you carry on, what do you go into? Spiritualism. You start putting your word above God's word, and what do you produce after that? False laterine message, and it leads you to where? Sun. Bound down to the sun. Okay, it's so how do you lay those down that he says monastic king, king, and Where do you start from that? Well, you just done that. Manasseh. Pray, pray to the power. Okay, pray, pray to the Manasseh. power. Kim is spit across the, he's ripping it up, so therefore that's spiritualism. And it's also Mark and then 11 when spiritual formation comes in. They're building secret chambers. Okay, yeah. Yeah. so they're going to come up with false laterine. Secret chambers, what? Second, what's where? Where do you? What's the first? Okay, so what happens with Manasseh? He said it. Pride of power. Okay, the pride. What's pride? Gadol, jealousy. It says there's a quote that said it was because of his pride that he was no, because of his jealousy against Christ that he produced the pride. So the two of them are. But we're, this is all correct, but that's, that's not where we're going yet. We have to put these in place first. Um, and we'll t take this up tomorrow where we left off because we got to see. Just, just let me read this, this last paragraph and tell you at least where we're going. It says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, thou shalt not lament for him, saying, Ah, my brother, or Ah, sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, Lord, or Ah, his glory. What's Ah? Woe. woe. It's woe. Okay. And then it says, He shall be buried with the burial of a what? An ass. So what's he being associated with here? The woes and the ass. Is that 9 11? Okay. Is that August 11th, 1840? Um. Anyway, it's all uh, what we've been teaching about these things are all in these kings' history as they fulfill the seven times. And the three one and the ahs too, because it's ah 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 for the person, and the last one is a glory. You know, the three individuals and then a glory. And there's a three one in Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and yeah. Daniel. They get carried into that history, and. Anyway, Sister Brittany, you want to pray? Um, Loud? Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we thank you for this day and thank you for this class today and I ask that you continue to open up these truths to us and help us to cement them in our minds. I pray that you be with us in our work today. Satan 